computer. Okay, good. Cool. All right. Um, so, Matt, do you want to introduce Terry? Yeah, so um, our speaker today is Terry Rudolph, uh, now for, formerly of Imperial College, now it's like once in. Um, people here probably know him as the R and the PDR theorem, but uh, he also has a long standing interest in more practical things. Um, and the mission of Psi Quantum is to build quantum computers with photons. Uh, that's what you're going to tell us about today. Thanks. Thanks, man. Um, yeah, someone should ping me if I'm not speaking loud enough. It sort of feels weird to yell from sitting down at a table. Yeah, so as Matt said, I now spend most of my time actually thinking about quantum computing with photons. Um, and this talk is the first time I've ever given this talk, which I should time check. Uh, how it runs for time, uh, but so yeah, I'm also looking for any feedback as to how it proved clarity wise. Um, I've prepared it as a fairly general talk, at least at the start. So, so let me start with uh, let me minimize this thing here. Do you have control of that? So let's just start with idealized classical computation. Idealized classical computation, you all know how it works. You have some input classical bits, you have some sort of uh, network gate, and the gate network is deterministic. And at the end of the day, you get out some output bit. Uh, that's the answer to your computation. And most of the time in this talk, I'm going to take time to run vertically up and down. And idealized quantum computation is normally described as just sort of a very close analog to that. So now my inputs are quantum bits or qubits. Uh, this here is the image of some ion, I think, called atom. And then you have, uh, again, gates between the qubits. Again, they're deterministic. Uh, so that if you think about the evolution in the Hilbert space of all these qubits, it's actually just a nice, smooth, continuous evolution. So this red thing is meant to represent the quantum state, and it just evolves uh, continuously through the Hilbert space. But at the end of the day, you do need to have classical information at your output, so you do make some kind of measurement to get out. So this is the standard way you go to Nielsen and Fung or quantum computing typically used. But there are other ways to do uh, quantum computing. So this is, a, again, still an idealized quantum computation. But in this model, we're going to use measurements instead of unitary gates. So uh, uh, computation, this kind of model looks something like this. You pick a couple of qubits. You do some kind of measurement. So in this case, some kind of two qubit measurement. And then you're going to get some classical bits as, as your outcome. And so in the next time step, you're going to pick some other qubits. You're going to do a measurement. You're going to get some kind of classical bits as your outcome. Next time step, you're going to pick different qubits. And which qubits you're measuring might depend on what the previous outcomes were. Okay, so this actually is the classical computer sitting on the side that runs. It tells you which qubits to measure. Now, in this model of quantum computing, you get your output classical bits. But if you think about the, the evolution of the system, it looks very different. You start off with some state in the Hilbert space, whatever the initial state these qubits were. And now at every time step, you're just discontinuously collapsing the state to a different point in the Hilbert space. As time goes on, you just keep collapsing it. And you don't have any control over where that, where that state collapses to because quantum measurements are random. Right? So it sort of seems, uh, you know, mildly miraculous that this also works for quantum computing. And, and it, I think the, you know, the simple expectation would be like, well, why would you do that? This has got to be kind of a, a sillier way to go, a, a more naive way to go, um, and certainly more problematic ways to build your quantum computer. But uh, I want to claim that measurements in some sense are better than unitary grades, or more measurements better than or more powerful in some sense unitary gates if you're actually trying to build a quantum 
that. And the, the simplest evidence I can give for that is uh, just the following, that if all your initial qubits were maximally mixed, then in the, in the conventional model of an idealized computation, doing unitary gains can't change that. They just stay maximally mixed the whole time. So you wouldn't actually be able, no matter how good your unitary gates were, you would not be able to do any kind of computation. But in fact, given even maximally mixed initial qubit states and just doing a very, very simple two qubit measurement, just measuring the total spin of the qubit, is it, is it spin zero or spin one of each pair, you can do universal quantum computing. Now, so, you know, you see, okay, yeah, measurements are in some sense more powerful. And what's really going on is that measurements re remove entropy. So, so even in this idealized world, the removal of entropy is something more powerful. And in fact, that uh, fact is what underpins what we call fault-tolerant quantum computing. So I'm interested in really building a real-world quantum computer right now. So I'm not really interested in any of those idealized models. Um, so what I'm going to talk a bit about now is, is you know, how we get to fault-tolerant quantum computing. And the reason we need fault-tolerant quantum computing, um, so this is a story so far, I've given you all the sort of idealized stuff. The reason why we need the fault-tolerant quantum computing uh, is just that uh, the, the stuff that we can build um, things out of is too noisy. We can't actually do very many operations before everything turns into uh, essentially random output. So in the non-idealized world, there's sort of two extremes of models of fault-tolerant quantum computation. There's the circuit-based approach. This is the sort of standard approach, I guess, the sort of thing um, most groups that are pursuing building a quantum computer uh, use, which is essentially to have static arrays of, of fixed qubits, maybe superconducting qubits, or ions, or atoms, to do entangling gates and measurements on them, um, and, uh, and and you know by using lots of tricks of error correction, we can get to fault tolerance this way. There's a completely different extreme, which is to use what we call cluster state quantum computing or the one-way model of quantum computation. And in this model, we start with entangled, uh, like extensively entangled quantum states. So we actually have, uh, you know, large scale entanglement over many qubits. And now we do single qubit measurement. And one of the differences, immediate differences, is that you can see that these single qubit measurements could be destructive because once we've done them, they disentangle from this entangled state. It wouldn't matter whether we still have a qubit or not. On the left, in fact, those entangling gates and measurements need to be non-destructive. And in the model I showed you just before, you know, the two qubit measurement model, we need them to be non-destructive. Now I work with photons and measurements on photons are destructive. So the model I'm going to, to introduce you to today sits somewhere in between the two extremes of these models. We try and take the best of both worlds. It's a model that we call fusion-based quantum computing. And in this model, we start with, we don't have extensive amounts of entanglement at the start. We actually have fixed, constant-sized, uh, entangled, what we call resource states. So that, those are the objects on which the computation takes place. Here I've just denoted them as like the ring of six angled qubits, but the rings are not themselves entangled. And then instead of doing single qubit measurements, we do two qubit measurements. So these measurements are called fusions, depicted here as these little red oval, and these are entangling measurements, but they're destructive entangling measurements. And we're going to drive the whole computation with these destructive entangling measurements. Um, so I want to explain a little bit of physics, which is, you know, how do we do these kinds of measurements? How do they work with photons? Okay. So photonic qubits uh, in, in the approach that we take basically are um, single photons that are constrained to a waveguide that's etched into a piece of semiconductor. Now the waveguide could just be a hole, like a channel in the semiconductor, or it could be like a different piece of, of semiconductor or a different dielectric. But basically, there's two possible path places that that photon could be. And if it's in this one channel, uh, that's going to be my qubit state zero. And if it's in the other channel, it'll be my qubit state one. And uh, when we want to do single qubit gains on this uh, photonic qubit, 
we can actually just bring the two channels together. Here is a, a picture that's sort of in the public record. I can't actually show you the ones that we build, but it's very, very similar, where we just bring the two waveguides close together and then we control, like a, a controlled amount of tunneling happens, and that does a beam splitter. That's a 50 50 beam splitter. And we can do some phase shifters and more 50 50 beam splitters, and that kind of thing can produce superpositions for us of the photon being one of the two channels. So that's our photonic cube. And what we want to understand is okay, how do we do these entangling measurements on them? And it turns out to be very simple. So again, I'm going to draw time sort of going downward. So these. This here depicts four of these waveguides that constrain the photons. The, uh, so this, for example, would be qubit one would be in the, the sort of state one, so be qubit two in state zero, depending on where the photon is, or it could be in the superposition. And then to make a, a gate, this fusion gate, that is actually the, the basis of the whole architecture, we bring those two waveguides together to do this 50-50 beam splitter, but then we immediately detect. We put detectors right at the output. So we don't do anything else, anything fancy, and we do the same with these two waveguides. So why does this do a non-trivial thing for us? Well, imagine that we see one photon uh, at this detector and one photon at this detector. If we see one photon up here, it had to have originated either in mode two here or in mode three. Okay. And so if it originated in mode two, that would be like this part of the wave function here. This photon must have originated from either one or four, but there's only one photon on, the, on modes one and two and one photon on modes three and four. So the only possible states that could cause a detection pattern like this are one, zero, one, zero, plus or minus, where the phase depends on which of these detectors. Zero, one, zero, one. So that's the sort of photonic version of that state, but written back in terms of qubits, remembering that one, zero is my qubit state zero, zero, one is my qubit state one. All I've done is just a two qubit uh, projection onto a Bell state. So it's extremely simple. This is the thing that in photonic quantum computing is the equivalent of the C naught, but it's actually an extremely simple and very, very trivial thing. In, in stabilizer language, which uh, we use for fault tolerance a lot, uh, this measurement when you detect one photon at the top and one photon at the bottom here is just to measure some non trivial uh, correlated stabilizers. So, for example, XX and ZZ. Now, the thing about this fusion measurement, as a, you know, as I've sort of hinted at already, is that it can be built extremely clean. It can be manufactured in silicon. Uh, it's extremely fast because the detectors uh, uh, detect single photons, in, in, you know, very rapidly. Um, so we can remove entropy from the system very quickly. This is a problem for many approaches. There are a few other things for which. Uh, why we like this gate as a way of, of to building a quantum computer. One is that it's effectively classical. A single photon moves through waveguides the exact same way that classical light does. So we don't have to do any quantum mechanics. We can actually just uh, solve Maxwell's equations and, and then to, to design these things and then to test them, you know, to compare with the, the designs, uh, we just inject classical light. Here in the state line, and um, this gives us, you know, makes the gate effectively classical. It also just sits there, it's not a dynamic object, so it doesn't change. You come back the next day, it's the same gate. There's a few other things that make it very desirable to us. One is that the error, the main error with photons is loss, and if, uh, if you encode your photons this way, then if you don't see two clicks, you know that you had an error. So you know that an error has occurred. And the main problem for quantum computing are errors that you don't know whether they've occurred. So we have ways of getting around this particular error. And then the, the last one uh, is that it has, a, has an extra amount of phase stability. So the thing is that all that matters for this gate to work is that I can't tell, when I see this photon, I can't tell, did it come from over here or did it come from over there? So that means that as long as the wave packets of the photons going in are the same, they can be some big jiggly thing. It doesn't really matter what they look like. All that matters is have I erased the information as to where that photon 
drive drop. This means that you can have very big wave packets, uh, and this is quite different to say if you encode your quantum information in a single mode of light. So you might say, well, I'm going to use a single waveguide, I'm going to use superposition between vacuum and one photon. As soon as you start using uh, superposition between uh, photon states a different number, you've got to start keeping your system much more stable, like sort of stable to, to about the wavelength of the system. And you also lose the ability to herald loss because you have an indeterminate photon number. So it's a very robust gate, uh, but it has disadvantages. And the two disadvantages are one is that it's destructive, you lose the qubits once you've done the measurement. And the other is that it's probabilistic. Sometimes you detect two photons up here. That means that, uh, that you, know, you know that qubit one was in the state one and qubit two was in the state zero. That's not an entangling measurement. So there are ways of uh, increasing the success probability of this gate. You can throw in extra photons as ancillas, uh, you know, it's, and there's a sort of other ways around this issue. I'm not going to get into them today, but those are the two disadvantages of this fusion gate. Okay, just to explain why we focus so much on a fault tolerant architecture, here are the sort of some of the best known uh, resource counts for running non-trivial algorithms, so for, for running you know, RSA, for uh, solving Komoko's and it's a popular sort of test case um, in quantum simulations or solving Fermi, Fermi Hubbard model, what you can see is that it's going to take billions of gates, billions of logical gates to do anything non-trivial. So you've got to have a way of suppressing your error rate down to sort of order of 10 to the minus 10 at least. Um, and uh, yeah, there's no way no one on the planet to really build qubits that are that robust. So this is why we focus so much on this fault tolerance architecture. And so fault tolerance is a difficult thing. I want to give you a high level view that I, I haven't seen sort of expressed elsewhere as to how it arises. It's not something which, unless you really get in the weeds of quantum computing, you typically get exposed to, but I think it, it's a very interesting piece of quantum mechanics once, once you fault tolerance quantum computation, imagine someone gives you this, this quantum computer, it's just sitting here running. Uh, what would you see? Well, you, as a kind of you know, monkey scale object, are only gonna see the classical bits of information. And so if you looked at the sort of, the sort of chunk of space time, as it were, all you would see is a whole bunch of classical bits. And how would you know that, you know, what's going on? Well, you look at the bits and they all just look random, like each individual bit looks locally random. But then if you investigate a bit further, what you'll find is that there are structures within those random looking bits, which always add up to have um, even parity, or almost always add up to have even parity. So you'll find little cubes, and the faces of all the bits on the cube will always, pretty much always be even parity, and different cubes within this lattice, it's actually like two interlocked cubic lattices, have this property, and then sometimes they seem to violate it, and, but most of the time it's there. So you'll see that, that sort of the majority of these classical bits will have these correlations. But then you'll occasionally see boundaries as you sort of move through checking all these parities around the cubes. You'll find points where the correlations uh, sort of skip half a ladder side or it's no, longer, um, it's no longer a full cube that you're adding up the bits and getting this even parity. And this becomes, when, as you sort of investigate through the set of classical bits, you find like an extended uh, extended object of, uh, of these sort of uh, skipped correlations or some kind of boundary. And it's a topological object. As you move through, if you did this for a full fault tolerant quantum computation, you would find many of these and you would find them sort of coming together and interacting in different ways. And that's what a topological fault tolerant quantum computation looks like, just that purely at the level of the, of the classical bits. And the thing that's sort of magical about it is that the qubits of the, of the computation really are the, are the correlations on these extended objects. They're not anything sort of, you know, down to do with the, the microscopic qubits. Yeah. Kind, of, kind of cool when you think about it. Uh, now, if you, if you zoomed in, like if you say again, and shrink down, and now I want to look at, like, how are those classical bits being produced? There's many different ways of producing them. But the point that I, I guess I want to emphasize is that it doesn't really matter how you produce them, as long as they have those correlations, those right sort of correlations that are fixed, 
uh, by, by whatever uh, route of fault tolerance you're taking, then it will be a fault tolerant quantum computation. It doesn't matter how you microscopically produce it. Bell's the answer. So the standard way of producing those classical bits is the following. You have a fixed static array of qubits, okay, maybe a 100 by 100 array of superconducting qubits. And as time goes on, this is a standard quantum circuit, red from left to right. You take those qubits four at a time and you couple them with some gates to an ancilla qubit here. And then uh, after you've done a whole bunch of C not gates and so on, you measure the ancilla qubit. And that's, the, that's where your um, classical, the classical bit arises from. So this is in standard circuit picture is really doing, you're doing a four qubit joint entangling measurement. And it's non-destructive. The four qubits that you made the measurement on, you know, they're still there and you use them again a few time steps later. And that's how you fill up this, this volume with the right uh, classical bits and correlations. At the other extreme is the thing I talked about before, which is the cluster state picture. Here you kind of already produce all of the entanglement. And now you're going to make this single qubit measurement that could be disruptive. That's how you get out your classical bits. And then in the fusion-based approach that I talked about before, it looks a bit different. So now we have taken the resource states and really put them in 3D. So you see those rings of six and sort of put them in a particular 3D geometry. But if you do this and you do the fusion measurement that I, I explained the physics of in detail earlier, that produces classical bits too. And all three of these things will, uh, you know, by choosing the right, by playing the right sort of game with, with your states and measurements, will produce the right correlations. In the in the platonic thing, in the, the fusion approach, it's not the same qubits, obviously, that are producing the classical bits. Okay. Um, and the other thing to say about it is that uh, the fusion here is doing both the error correction and running the algorithm. So the choice of you can choose to do some extra single qubit gates, uh, you know, build them into that fusion operation if you wanted to. Um, and that actually that runs the algorithm as well as does the error correction. It's all sort of wrapped up in the same thing. So we don't start with something and then sort of build up to fault tolerance. It's just sort of built into the system. So. Okay. So um, this will be the only slide that I talk a little bit about the mathematics of that. And you know, if you're not an expert on error correction fault tolerance, maybe you can zone out. For a little bit, but if you want to say, you know, how is it that we get fault tolerance in this thing? Well, we have to start in this fusion, what we call, so we call this thing FBQC, fusion-based quantum computing. We start with a graph or a network, we can lay out those resource states on and we identify which ones are going to undergo this destructive measurement. So we have a, a stabilizer group that, that describes, you know, the stabilizer states that are the resource states, that are for the resource state. And we have a different Pauli group um, of the ideal fusions, which are the projections onto those Bell states. Uh, it's not a stabilizer group because measurements can be plus or minus one, so it kind of has to have both plus and minus uh, stabilizers, in, as it were. We then have uh, the elements of the resource state that commute with that, the elements of that commute, commute with that. These are what we call, we just give the terminology, surviving stabilizers. And what we're actually really interested in is what are the, the, the restrictions of those stabilizers to the unmeasured qubits you can see on the boundary here. And so that, uh, um, that set of stabilizers, if you're into topological fault tolerance, are the things that really become the logical operators if you properly construct this whole fault tolerance network. Okay. The thing that gives us fault tolerance is uh, the check operator group. So basically, there's a bunch of, um, of operators that you've gone and done all these measurements. And now uh, you can add up the parodies, like I was talking about, around a whole bunch of different um, cubes or depending on what the network is. And those things, sometimes, most of them should all be plus one. If you had no errors, they would all. all Parities would always be even, but sometimes they're a minus one. And so you actually generate a different graph, not the fusion network graph, a completely different graph that we call the syndrome graph, where you uh, identify places where those, those minus one flips have happened. And fault tolerance comes from choosing this graph in such a way that you get a high amount of redundancy uh, in 
in the in, uh, in this check operator group so that you have a high chance of identifying how to correct for correct for those errors. Now the errors themselves break up into you know various different types. It's the detectable ones, which are anything that does flip an operator in the uh, check operator group. There's undetectable errors, which are the ones that do not. There's trivial undetectable errors are things that just commute with the with the um, surviving stabilizers on the upper qubit. So on the unmeasured qubit. So those we don't really care about. And then the things that we do care about are the sort of non-trivial undetectable errors. And to make something fault tolerant, you've got to make the weight of those uh, uh, increase as the graph gets bigger that I lay these things in. So it's just a set of like kind of mathematical restrictions. And once you understand what those are, you can run through and check all the sorts of different resource states and all the different graphs that you think might be useful. And in fact, it is not the case that just picking any old resource states in any old graph gives you fault problems. It takes a lot of skill to design those things. Um, sensible. Uh, two things to note about this is one that all errors that happen, it's kind of like uh, I don't know if you've ever heard of the spam problem in tomography, which is how do you separate what's you know an error in the state and what's an error in measurement? Here we don't care, okay? Because all that matters is like, have we got the right classical correlations built into this thing? And so the simplest way to think of it is that all the errors in, we can just describe them at least in this simplest way as uh, take an idealized resource state preparation and apply errors to it and then take uh, and, and then do an ideal fusion on it. Uh, generate the sort of right weight of, of errors through this graph. And then the other thing is that to, to emphasize is that the decoding here, so like you know, fault tolerance and error correction, you always got to run a decoder that tries to work out where the errors are. Same kind of thing, you're running it on the syndrome graph, you kind of work out um, you know what are the most likely corrections that you can apply. But now we've destroyed these qubits. So it's not that we're going to run the decoder and then find an error correction to apply to the physical qubits that have undergone the error. What we get out of the decoder is effectively um, an element you know, of the Pauli group that should be uh, applied to the remaining qubits, the unmeasured qubits. In fact, it's a Pauli frame. You don't even apply this correction. You just say, oh, I'm going to reinterpret the, the operators on these unmeasured. Okay, so that's fault tolerance in a nutshell for fusion-based approach. Okay, so where are we at? Well, we looked at some idealized models of quantum computing and then these fusion measurements and then like a very, very, very high level view of what the fault tolerance quantum computation looks like, the kind of abstract level. So now I want to give you a slightly more like, here's the space-time view of doing one of these fusion-based things, which is what we're madly uh, building it's like one. So the space-time view um, goes something like this. We have a device that roughly every nanosecond will output an entangled state. So I'm going to call that thing a resource state generator. Okay. And I'm just going to take the piece of this very simple picture of it. Okay, it's a six photons because each photon is dual rail, that's really the same well mode, but you could have different size resource states. But the thing that's kind of important for this approach is uh, different resource states uh, uh, um, are useful for different types of errors in the hardware that produces this thing. But whatever it is, it's a constant size, and the size will be somewhere between you know two qubits of bell pair all the way up to you know, the maximum that you could imagine would be on the order of 30 qubits. Whatever it is, it's just some constant size, just bang, bang, bang. You need a bigger state, the worse the hardware that you're using to generate it is. Possibly counterintuitive because you're making a bigger state with worse hardware. It's, it's like more certain that it's going to be a really rubbish state. How full works. Okay, so the sort of space, the idealized space-time view of, the, of this FBQC would look like this. I take a whole array of these resource state generators, and then uh, what you can see depicted here is that at each time cycle you generate them, and then you immediately fuse them. Uh, so of the six qubits, some of them get, or well, most of them, in fact, get immediately fused with their neighboring resource state. But some of them get delayed one time step. So the ones that are staying lit 
for one extra time step. They get delayed one time step, so they get put into a little loop that holds them for a nanosecond. And then they get fused, they go through a fusion gate with a, with a qubit that's produced in the, in the next clock cycle. Okay? And then you can see this, uh, you know, the, picks, the classical bits of information, which are the things that you run the parity checks on and run your, your decoder on. So, so that's what this uh, like lovely little animation that, thank God, I did not have to make uh, is trying to depict. Okay. And, but now I want to give you a, a sort of uh, explain in detail um, a concept that we call interleaving, which I think is one of the most powerful things about photonics. So interleaving is basically this. Instead of using a whole bunch of different resource state generators, instead of taking hundreds of different resource state generators and producing them, we can take one resource state generator and connect it to itself using optical fiber in a way that kind of produces the same volume of classical correlated bits at the end of the day. Remember, that's all we need for the spot tolerance to work. Okay. And I want to explain a little bit in detail because uh, I think this is something which could be relevant for other approaches as I'll, as I'll explain at the end, how this whole thing is wired up. So basically, you take your resource state generator. So this thing in the center here is, is uh, the RSG, whatever device it is that's producing six, uh, in this case, a six ring resource state on a nanosecond clock cycle. So here it is, produced six, uh, produce six photonic qubits. Okay. And the photonic qubits go uh, in, and some of them hit these, uh, these um, sort of funny shieldy looking things, okay, which are actually just a delay. Okay. And the number of the delay tells you how many clock cycles that photon gets delayed for. So this is a sort of depiction of on, on the left here. The photon comes into the delay. So delay of 30 is actually holding 30 clock cycles worth of photons. And the delay is really just a one in, one out delay. So each clock cycle, it just run, you know, the photon comes in and the photon goes out. You can't access the photons while they're in that delay. And uh, so as my six photons go along, some go into delays. And then coming out on that same clock cycle is a photon that is not one that they were born with in the resource state generator. It's, it's no longer their partner. Their partner's trapped in one of these delays, it's a photon from a different, from a different uh, clock cycle resource state. And then going along, they encounter a switch. So these things here are switches. And the switch, so this photon here could be switched into, say, this F for fusion, which is the thing I showed you before, very simple game, or uh, this fusion, for example. But the fusions, in fact, we have to make them a bit more complicated than the thing I showed you. So the thing I showed you was this, which was how to do a two qubit measurement. We also need the ability to do single qubit measurements. So the, the device that does these fusions can actually take the photonic qubit and um, measure it in X, Y, Z, or even do some funny rotation to make the magic state. Uh, but it's basically just the waveguides and detectors. It's actually a very simple device. So now, uh, depending on what, what switches they encounter here, the photons go into various different fusion configurations. But notice that like this photon might get switched into this fusion configuration that looks like it goes out here um, and out to what we call the west. Yeah. Now, it could, at that point, depending on if you have many different resource state generators, it could be that going out there, it's actually taking it to fuse with a photon from a different resource state generator. But in the most extreme uh, case, I only have one resource state generator, and so it just basically connects to itself. And if you wire this thing up so that the west and the east connect to each other and the north and the south connect to each other, then what you find is that it really does exactly what I've just described here. The north and south are the sort of vertical lines. In and in this example, it's basically making an array of like a 30 by 30 array. So I need a delay of 900 clock cycles to go in the vertical directions and then delays of 30. So, as I run. Okay. so why am I making, you know, why am I sort of going into detail on this? Because uh, the numbers for this approach 
if you use optical fiber, are very favorable. Optical fiber is like a magic quantum technology. Of course, it's you know, part of how we talk on the internet all the, all the time. But optical fiber is actually incredibly good at keeping quantum bits alive. And so what this lets us do is build these delays in optical fiber. And as an example, you could build a delay of, let's say, a kilometer. So here's, here's some numbers. What that would be letting you do is build a lattice of, of you know, L by L is 71 qubits. The delay loss would only be a few percent, which means that the, what we call the baseline threshold, the loss rate of the photons coming out of the resource state generator, each photon could have a loss rate of a few percent. And I would still be able to, uh, in this particular way of wiring it up that I showed you, I'd still be able to do quantum computation. Now, part of that, of course, is just that it's, you can tolerate high loss. And then, you know, these numbers are, are not close to the best numbers. This is actually just for using Tory code, which is not the best way of going per se. Um, but, you know, it's information that's sort of publicly out there. And this is not taking into account all sorts of other areas and things that can happen. But it's more just to give the sense that like, these are not uh, crazy numbers. Because uh, even if you're not into photonic quantum computing, even if you're into building your quantum computer with matter-based qubits, you can still consider the following option, which is take your matter-based qubits. And instead of trying to put many of them together and then controllably interacting with each other, take them and just say, turn them into a module that just produces small entangled states on a clock cycle. So no kind of logic and control and so on. Just stick them there, have them spit out, have them create entangled states on a cycle. And then you have to be able to do transduction of some form or another, which is to get the entangled state of, the, of these matter-based qubits onto photons. And that can be hard, depends on the system. But all matter-based qubits eventually connect to photons. Why? Because if you can read about it you know, in the New York Times, it connected to photons one way or the other. Okay, so there is some way of getting quantum information from that matter-based qubit into photons, some cleaner, harder, easier than others. So find out what's the best way of doing that. And the matter-based qubits can do the small-scale entanglement generation much more easily than we can do it with photonic qubits. For us, uh, it's a probabilistic process, it takes a lot of, of uh, sources in order to make these are small scale entangled qubits. But the rest of this stuff, the stuff here that I drew here, these switches and the delays and stuff, is very, very easy. So, what you get by building the rest of this stuff here is an entanglement amplification. It's like a space time amplification of your entanglement um, very, very cheaply. So, rather than building you know, huge numbers of physical qubits, it just seems obvious to me that the long term future, I think there's you know, three really good reasons why photons. Like the long-term future of quantum computing is photonic, and one of them is this: that you essentially have incredibly good quantum delays, you know, sort of trivial quantum memories in some sense. Okay, so where are we at? I've now given you, you know, the zoomed-out view of fault tolerance, an abstract view of fusion-based quantum computing, and space-time view of it using interleaving. Okay, so where I want to, what I want to talk about now is a bit more about the hardware. That was all very much a, a theoretician's overview, but this is still going to be very much a theoretician's overview of the hardware, unfortunately. I work on the, really understand uh, much of the hardware is super there. Okay, so what does a large scale photonic quantum computer look like, and how can we be sure it will work? Well, what we know it, it does not look like is this. Mm -hmm. okay. No one is going to build a photonic quantum computer or something like this. Amusingly, the title of this file on Wikipedia is chaotic. <laughs> <laughs> so, the, uh, yeah, we are not trying to build a photonic quantum computer like this. In fact, remember, our main challenge is to build these resource state generators. That's the, uh, the main challenge for photonic quantum computing. And we want to do it using fully integrated silicon photonics. So the kind of thing I showed you at the start, photons, that are made in a semiconductor foundry that is the same foundry there's only that, that produces laptops and cell phones. In fact, there's only a few, like three of those, three or four of those foundries on the planet. There's many, many smaller bespoke uh, or academic foundries, but uh, the tool sets in these big foundries gives us much, much better performance. 
so orders of magnitude in certain parameters. And we want to be able to, you know, ultimately our machine is a million qubit machine. So we are very focused on the manufacturability of everything we produce. And, and we only design components and things that work in one of these tier one chip tabs. And very critical performance from. So this is, you know, uh, it's basically saying, you know, the optical table is put together by grad students and you can, you can tolerate errors in grad students. Of course, they smell and are annoying and many other things, but you don't want to be doing that if you're trying to build a really good machine. Another reason to really like the silicon photonics is you can also make the electronics in, in, in silicon. And photons are actually quite big as qubits, like the wavelength of these photons, 500 nanometers. So uh, the transistors are actually quite small, and so we can, we can put dense electronics very, very close to the qubits. The photons don't feel any heat, which is sort of a miracle that, you know, the Hamiltonian is zero, they basically see no environment, uh, it's why they, they quantum part of what we do is so trivial. And that means we can also put the pop electronics near them. Okay. We do need uh, to run at liquid helium, and that's because of the photon detectors. In principle, that could be changed, but in practice, the best detectors that, that we have today run at uh, liquid helium temperatures, so a few Kelvin. Okay. Um, and, but, you know, that's still a thousand times Cooling capacity than really Kelvin systems, and uh, you know, it's a, sort of a gives us a, something that we can stare down using cryo plants that are you know, smaller than the biggest ones that get built today already. And then, of course, another reason why we really like this uh, fully integrated silicon photonic approach is just the kind of thing I showed you already, which is you know networking and connectivity and modularity is just very natural in this time. Put the photons in five and take them out. So, okay. So the, the sort of core of the architecture is something which looks, uh, you know, abstractly like this, which is you have a photonic chip which contains the sources and the detectors and uh, and fiber attach. And the fiber attach is to bring in both pump laser light to to stimulate the single photon production um, from the sources and also to take single photons out. Okay. And then basically, uh, we sit on top of that with, with a, with a particular type of bond, uh, an electronic chip, which in this case has 750 million transistors. Okay, which, you know, if you've ever thought about trying to bring control lines into a dilution refrigerator and control, you know, superconductor qubit chip, like this is kind of a miracle. It's like you can do local logic control tuning a whole bunch of stuff right next to this photonic chip. And what's kind of amazing about it is this chip is running pretty hot. And the detectors in here are uh, you know, at a few Kelvin. That sort of violates my theorists' uh, intuitions about thermodynamics, but the engineers said it would work, and it did. Um, an old version of this. Uh, yeah, let me, let me just sort of show you some of the photonic chips, which is sort of where the quantum stuff is at. So this is a zoom in on a 300 millimeter wafer produced at um, Global Foundries, who's our production partner. And it's like many different chips of the, of the photonic components. So on this thing, you know, one of these wafers is, is equivalent to maybe a few hundred thousand of those chaotic tens of thousands of sources and detectors or millions of components of these things. Very impressive looking devices, but thing is, uh, you know, we have to design and measure and get feedback and, and work out like how to improve these things all the time. So effectively, you have to set up a system. You can't have grant students going in and like coupling in lasers and stuff. So this thing here, that looks like a record player, is actually just a robot that goes through injecting light in, making measurements, taking detection, and so on. And then you have what looks, uh, you know, to old people like Matt, uh, the CD changer he used to have in the back of his car. It's like a million dollar version of that, but now for a 300 millimeter wafer. And um, you just load the wafers. We use thousands, tens of thousands of these wafers that get loaded in. Um, and then a robot like, basically goes along and, and measures them. So we get incredibly precise tomographic information about every component of the building, how the designs work. So it's, uh, 
very non-academic type of thing. This is a picture of, uh, it's an old picture now, this is not, um, not the current generation, in fact, I don't even know exactly what these electrical boards are. Popper watches things out here, but the, the, uh, I'm not allowed to show most of the hardware we produce, but this is the chip with the fibers coming in, and then this is the thing that gets put in the cryostatics to cool from underneath. Uh, quite aggressively. Okay, so, yeah, that all sounds really good. Yeah, great, manufacturable, you know, devices look very nice and so on, but as anyone who lives in the real world knows, there's a big difference between you know, what the engineer designs or says that they, they're gonna build and the result. That's why we need all this air interaction, fault tolerance stuff and so on. Okay. And for what we're doing, uh, there's basically on the order of somewhere between 20 and 30 major error sources that we have to consider, or major imperfections or things that, um, that we have to control well in order to be sure that the machine is going to work. So this is the list of sort of slightly uh, condensed list of, the, of those. Okay. Every parameter here is something which can go wrong and effectively uh, you know, change, um, uh, you know, m multiply up through the machine in such a way that it could potentially stop us from uh, being fault tolerant. So, uh, you know, some of these things might be obvious, some are not. I can talk my way through if I have time if anyone wants to understand more about any of these areas. But um, the thing that, you know, we're now spending millions of dollars building a machine with all these devices. Like we want to know that things gonna work, right? So we have to be able to say like, you know, if, if some engineer comes to us and talks about one of these errors and so we need to understand what its impact will be amplified up through the machine. And so to do that, it's taken a team of you know, many people, many tens of people, several years to build basically a simulation stack that does the following. This, this, these, sort of, these are the main five pieces of the stack. Each piece itself has several different kind of fully developed uh, software tools in it. But roughly speaking, the simulation stack works like this. Over here is a, a simulation primarily run by the engineers, which are simulations of um, like thermal modeling of the components, uh, simulations of um, like solving Maxwell's equations, because that's what governs how photons move, so uh, finite difference time domain simulations. Um, for the sources, there's numerical integration of Schrodinger equation, but you know, it's basically like hardcore engineering, and that's the stuff that um, the data that comes back from the test and measurement team uh, has to always kind of be reconciled with. So this, this kind of software stack here, some of it's commercial software, some of it's bespoke, uh, gets fed to um, uh, some photonic architects, the so people who work on the neuroptics. And at this level in the stack, essentially the simulation is second quantized photons. So we have photons here. It's a, it's a, it's a, a tool, a series of tools that can simulate um, these photons using uh, kind of compactified versions of what comes out here that capture the quantum properties of those photons that are relevant further up in the machine. Now, in this, this part of the software stack, basically we have photons being produced on the left and then small entangled states coming out on the right. We call these things seed states. Then the next part of the software stack, so, th so those are seed states, the photons have become qubits. On the left, we don't have qubits, but on the right, we really have qubits. Um, we then have to look at what is the resource state that we want to generate. As I said, different sizes and different like, configurations of the types of entanglement within the resource state have very, very different robustness properties to different types of errors. So we have to have different types of circuits for generating those resource states. And so this part of the, the, the simulation stack basically looks at that. It, how, what are the best ways? And it turns out there's many, many ways to go from bell pairs to another entangled state, for example. We then, at this point, those resource states go into something which simulates the fusions, and now we're at the point of all the class, you know, that I showed you before, of just a whole bunch of classical bits sitting in the space time. So this part of the, the, the fusion network, we basically go from qubits to, to essentially classical information that can be fed to a decoder and so on. 
the final part of the the the, the stack is the uh, that we want to simulate the you know the what what determines uh, what algorithm you run are, are choices of switching on these fusion networks. So you set some phase shifter that chooses what algorithms you run. Doing logical gates in these topological codes is a very non-trivial thing to simulate. In fact, I think very few people have really simulated fault tolerance you know, on non-trivial um, quantum circuits. But we certainly do it. And so we, we have uh, the ability to, to essentially see how things that happen all the way down this this chain affect the performance of a logical game. And so we, we sort of now, you know, in the last uh, year or so, have gone to the point where we really can, you know, engineer can come along and say, this tool is going to increase the variance in the line width of, you know, this nanowire or some, some uh, you know, interface of semiconductor or something. And we can run a simulation through various different architectures because different fusion networks and different uh, entangled states are really different architectures, and find out how will that performance on this piece of hardware affect the logical gate error at the end of the day. This has just been an absolutely massive uh, job to do, but a, a sort of relief to get the results out and to be able to say, now we're sort of masters of our own destiny. We know exactly you know, what we have to build to what kind of performance and when, you know, different ways of mitigating different types of errors. Uh, there's no sort of unknown unknowns in this whole game. So, yeah, you know, it's uh, the sort of work that we uh, work very, very many PhDs in academia. Um, and obviously, most of the theorists doing the work here are PhDs. But actually, in, within the whole company, here's uh, an old photo. Out of 150 people, about a third of the technical staff are physicists, uh, but about two thirds are basically semiconductor engineers or people from the classical engineering world who, uh, you know, don't know any quantum mechanics. We try and teach them some, get them enthused about it, um, but they're doing the actual nitty gritty of designing components uh, according to specs that the architecture team design and run the sort of full simulation step building. So this is a pre-COVID photo. We're now, I guess, a little bit bigger than this. Um, but you know, one of the things that we're doing is we, we had a major round of fundraising recently, so we're hiring people, different expertise. There's many different teams within this company. It's not all just uh, people who do you know, quantum algorithms or something. There's uh, foundry engineering teams, cryogenic teams, all sorts of different, just different types of teams that, that use different skill sets. So I'm trying to get the word out. I mean, the only reason I'm really agreeing to give talks these days is to get the word out. What we found in the past is, is uh, you find one or two brilliant people really can shift the needle on how to build stuff. Um, so if you're interested, you can apply to us. And that's basically uh, my overview. I think I'll leave it at that and just leave you with it. Um, a list of some of the papers. What I've talked about today is basically captured in these two papers, fusion-based quantum computing and interleaving. Um, the, this paper is uh, interesting if you want to sort of get an impression of fault tolerance that isn't so much about like extended error correction, but rather about thinking about fault tolerance in terms of fault tolerant channels. Uh, and so this paper which sort of shows how you can use the fact that the photons don't care about being put in, in a three plus one dimensional space time. We can actually, you know, imagine putting photons to build higher dimensional objects. It's kind of a motivating paper. How do I do for time? You good? Pretty good. Do you want to share the questions since you have the Zoom? Yeah, I can. Yeah. Um, so, so uh, we'll start with questions in the room. Should we? You guys would like to ask at the target? Yeah. Yeah, I was uh, wondering what decides the sizes of the resource types. Yeah. So um, it really it really depends on so yeah. So the way fault tolerance works. So 
like I guess any error correction, the noisier the systems are, and the stuff you make you know, using to build your your system, with, the larger the code. You okay. Now you know the important thing about this fusion-based quantum computing is that, given noisier systems, we do not need. Uh, so, so yeah, the bigger the code, or given noisier systems, we need more resource states, but each resource state is still a constant size. But uh, which resource state you use uh, will really depend on what the errors are in the components that make that resource state. And, and the sort of rule of thumb is the noisier the components being used to make the resource state, the bigger it will need to be. So there's sort of two scalings that happen. One is that, yeah, you need more of the resource state. Okay, so you, you need to either more resource state generators or you need to do way more interleaving. Uh, but even the, the resource state itself, the bigger, the noisier the system is. And if there's too much noise, then no size of resource state and no amount of that scaling. You know, you're back in a world where you're not doing computation at all. But it's really, Dependent on the specific structure of the errors as to which re which, you know which resource state you need, and even for a fixed number of qubits, it is not the case that like oh the best resource state is always a GHD state or it's always a, a ring of six or whatever. It really depends on the structure of the errors. Okay, use it. So. <clears throat> Sorry. Um, so I was wondering, like, can you said at some point, like, that is simulate the qubits uh, using Maxwell's equation. So if single photons propagate. So if you want to understand, you know, how does this, how is a single photon going to propagate? Yeah, it's a slightly counterintuitive thing that you that all that matters is the structure of the modes, okay. and that's actually just determined by Maxwell. So a single photon is like an excitation of a superposition over some different modes. Mm -hmm. you know, and, and a mode, so a mode is just a degree of freedom of a photon. It's like it's polarization, spatial mode, frequency, so some sort of thing, whatever it is. And, and Maxwell, solving Maxwell's equations tell you the mode structure of whatever object you have. And then you know that the single photon, if you know what is, which modes it's a superposition over, then you know how it will propagate through that structure. So yeah, it's, it's a slightly odd thing with the, it's like a, I used to ask my undergrad students, you know, what's the difference between the Born rule and Malus's law? Malus's law I take is, you know, take, when you take two pieces of Polaroid, Put them there and rotate them you know, put horizontal line through, or you put another piece in between. Now you get transmission. Okay. Then quantum mechanics, that's just a coherent state of mind. Is that the Born rule or not? Because if I put single photons through the exact same thing, it definitely is the Born rule. And normally it would be described as you know, in terms of muscles. No one ever gave me satisfactory answers. <laughs> Maybe it doesn't exist. Um, yeah, but so it's, it's, it is very powerful because it means that we're not trying to solve Schrodinger equation over all these crazy big devices. There's other advantages of this architecture, which I don't know really well. One is that the photons uh, only need to encounter a, a fixed number of components. So the delay, you know, the delays are quite long, but they only pass a fixed number of switches or a fixed number of boosters from birth to death. Even, so no matter how big you make the computation, the world line of every photon is constant. And that's important because photons get lost, so loss is the main error mechanism. And so it's not like, say, with a matter-based system, you know, the qubit's going to stay there. So as the computation gets bigger, you can just keep using that compute, that same qubit indefinitely. It's really important for these architectures for the photons. You know, I make this constant size resource state and then they're gone. And it doesn't matter how big of a computation they are sort of part of, their own uh, lives are sort of short and miserable and bad. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go to the Zoom question. So I had one Zoom comment saying, uh, going to teach, but fun, fun talk, thanks. Uh, any other 
the Zoom questions. Okay, so so maybe uh, I I have I have lots of questions, but maybe I have some questions. Go ahead. <laughs> First of all, to go back to the previous slide with the picture, um, do you guys have a bed outside the front of your office? In <laughs> fact, <laughs> this, this, this was actually uh, this was actually at the north side. Oh, okay. <laughs> sure. um, now the question I really want to ask. Which you're not allowed to answer is how close are you? Um, Closer than we were yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I mean, do you, uh, you know, in, in, fault to in proofs of fault tolerance, we normally talk about um, error rates, um, threshold rates. Yeah. Do you have a, a threshold estimate for this kind of art architecture? Yes. Yeah, so well, okay. So the way you think of, of what we do is, um, and this is literally what we do. There's these twenty odd. Um, Parameters, yeah. some of which are like errors, and some of which are just kind of performance parameters. So, performance parameter, uh, you know, might be um, decoder speed. Yeah, like decoder speed. In fact, that's sort of we, we used to be worried about. You know, things that, anyway, yeah. So, some some of these are things that are that are sort of just architectural choices, and then some are like just the errors that come. And uh, it did. A choice of fusion network and resource state, and a way of making the resource state, which is very dependent on how you make them. Basically, you can think of a space where you know we, we actually do draw diagrams where there's like 20 lines that go out, and then you know here's the detector efficiency of this architecture is here and then here and here, and you sort of get some like kind of weird shape. And you're like this architecture can tolerate, you know, the performance of all of these things as long as they lie within this region. And then we get a completely different architecture with a completely different region. So this is actually difficult because you can't tell the engineer, you know, you've got to give the engineers the numbers at the end of the day. Okay. I shouldn't say it publicly, but like we basically, you know, we, we, are, we are quite pessimistic. We basically make them go for numbers that are that are sort of stricter than what we actually tolerate. So every one of these parameters, like there is some some way that they, they currently sit on that line, somewhere we want them to get. Um, certainly more than half of them are already past like where, you know, anywhere that we need them to be. Um, like three quarters, I don't know, I probably shouldn't say, but like you know, most of them are, are where we need them. They've already crossed some architecture. In fact, like there is always some architecture that for one of those parameters can tolerate effectively arm So the switch loss was the only error we can tolerate 100 percent So it's it's not the you know it's really a, it's, it's really a game of uh, choosing the right architectures. Uh, the, the the long poles in the tent are not really at that like kind of component level stuff, and they're not quantum. They're all about classical assembly. Putting stuff together, like integrated systems yeah. and communication. So it's, you know, it's not. I'm not trying to say it's easy or solved or anything, but it's a, it's just a different type of problem than what we were facing. When we sort of start. Yeah. So so I I'm trying, I read your uh, manifesto about uh, <laughs> uh, photonic quantum computer yeah. versus the the. Uh, Very fine. But uh, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so I'm just saying, you know, I know you can't say. I'm trying to get, I'm trying to get a sense of how much better or worse you're doing than the the, the big the big guys who are trying to build a super, superconducting qubits. Um, I mean, I, I think we have a thoroughly understood and simulated that. I mean, we, you know, five or six years ago, we were saying you need four torrents, you need a million qubits, and no one was saying that. It was very difficult to raise based on those. But we said, well, we, you know, we, that's what we're going for from the start. Um, and so we built the company and you know, we have built the team around that. And uh, I just think that, you know, we have an architecture that we can lay blueprints out and go, this, this is an architecture that works. And I, I just don't believe, I don't believe in putting a million qubits and build cryptids or whatever it is. You know, I just I think that there's so many unknown unknowns in those approaches. Now, yeah, I'm not saying they don't have advantages, sure. Um, but I, I really doubt it's possible to do a comparison until they've 
The other thing to say is that, you know, until you have proper fault tolerance, it isn't, I mean, maybe, maybe, maybe that's a good foundational question, but like, what is a good metric of, of progress? Right? Every quantum computing company will like to invent their own metric. Yes, they do, yeah. And it's a game we just haven't gotten into, but, you know, a metric that would, roughly speaking, be the kind of thing that would be um, advantageous to us, in not just you know, in a PR sense, but actually in understanding what there is advantageous and understanding how much progress we make is, is something like the density of entanglement in space and time volume. Because the thing is, we can make a billion qubits, right? But, you know, this is the great thing about photons, like we can make a billion entangles, you know, put a single photon on a beam splitter, you have entanglement, uh, you know, that's just running a source at a gigahertz, right? So you can make a billion of them in space time volume of second, but it's not useful in that. All of the stuff we do in resource state generation is basically compressing that stuff down to make it denser and denser and of course have you know some entanglement properties that lead to fault tolerance. But roughly speaking, entanglement density captures how much progress you're making. And uh, you know, if I really wanted to annoy Google IBM or something like that, compute their entanglement density versus ours, I think we could measure it right but done. So, so, so most of these uh, quantum computing efforts start with a relatively small number of qubits and run some kind of algorithm and then do some kind of error correction. And it seems like you're taking a very different approach. You're trying to say, let's get fault tolerance from the beginning, and then and then once it works, then we'll run algorithms. But but surely you must have made, you must be able to run some kind of algorithms in the non-fault tolerance sense. Have you done that? Not really, because what I said about the logical correlations are the qubits. It's, it's also true that if you don't, if you if you haven't made a big enough system and or that your noise rates are too high, you don't have any correlation. Those are the qubits, right? So I, you know, I could, I mean, I could say, I could say, again, I could tell you like, oh yeah, we produce crap loads of entanglement that if people were trying to produce that using regular quantum algorithms or something, that would be equivalent to running a you know, Grover's algorithm but you know, you could come up with some narrative like that. But we don't need to, you know, we manage to convince people to give us money without having to do silly stuff. So we just but yeah, you're right, it is a very inverted inverted approach, um, which has you know strengths and weaknesses when you're trying to communicate it to the outside world for sure. So, so lots more to talk about, but maybe we should end the formal seminar now. And let's uh, thank Terry again for this wonderful talk. Andrew, is there anyone you don't recognize on the Zoom? No. <laughs> <laughs> I want to know how my students think because my quantum